Okay, this is uh, chapter six of the Pharaohs of Ancient Egypt by Elizabeth Payne. Chapter six is the Smiter of the Asiatics, Pharaoh Thutmose III. This goes from about 1484 BC to about 1461 BC. Okay. In a matter of months after Hatshepsut's death, Pharaoh Thutmose III was ready, quote, to smite, end quote, the rebellious Syrian princelings. He had recruited an army of 20,000 men and brought them together in a sprawling camp outside the Egyptian frontier fortress of Zaru in the eastern delta. There is barefooted infantrymen, there his barefooted infantrymen were armed with swords, shields, and bows and arrows. His charioteers were issued javelins and daggers, and his army's heavy ox-drawn supply wagons were loaded with beer, bread, and extra equipment for the long march ahead. At last, all was ready. Pharaoh's advance scouts and spies slipped out of camp one dark night, and a few days later, the army was underway. To the call of trumpets, the troops filed out through the gates of Zaru and onto the great commercial road that followed the Mediterranean coast northward into Palestine and Syria. In the lead was a single chariot carrying the standard of Ammon, a golden ram's head crowned with a shining disc that represented the sun. Behind Ammon's escort marched the royal bodyguards and then came Thutmose himself. He was driving his own war chariot, his sturdy body braced against the pull of its high-strung team of black stallions. On his head, the blue leather war, war helmet of the pharaohs glinted like steel in the bright sunlight. Do you guys remember what um, a standard is? What's, the, what's a standard? A standard is something that an army brings into battle kind of represent who they are right mm -hmm. exactly so it's sort of like their flag if you will almost uh, it's not like a woven material typically but um something that helps people know who they are right who they are okay team after team of chariots followed him their excited horses held down to a trot then came the foot soldiers stretching back along the road for miles and kicking up a great cloud of dust as they moved along Bringing up the rear were the supply wagons, lumbering along behind their teams of patient white oxen. Once they were beyond the frontiers of Egypt, Pharaoh gave his troops little rest. In 20 days, he marched them across the desert, up into the green lowlands of Palestine, and northward to the town of Yemen, in the foothills of the Carmel Mountains. There, his advanced scouts and spies were waiting for him with important news. The Prince of Kadesh and his Syrian forces were encamped in front of the fortified city of Megiddo. On the other side of the mountain, there were three routes Pharaoh could follow into Megiddo. One led around the base of the mountain to the left, a second around the mountain's base to the right. Both were excellent roads, wide and safe from ambush. There was also a third route much shorter, but extremely dangerous. This one was a narrow pass that led directly up over the mountain and down the other side. What do you think he's going to do? Which way is he going to take? This is um, Pharaoh Thutmose III, a picture of him. History's first great general, it says. So, okay. Thutmose summoned his commanders and held a council of war. Which of the three routes should the army take into Megiddo? Without hesitation, his officers advised against the mountain pass, as, he had the, as had the scouts. How should we go by this road, which is narrow and risky? They asked. Our scouts tell us that the enemy is waiting there for us, ready to hold the way against any multitude. The troops would have to march single file over the pass, unable to protect themselves from ambush. Will not horse have to come behind horse and man behind man likewise? The officers asked, shall our vanguard be fighting while our rear guard cannot yet get into action? There are yet two other roads. Let our victorious Lord march by the road he chooses. 
but let him not oblige us to go by this difficult road. This was sound military advice. But Thutmose rejected it impatiently. I swear as Ra loves me and my father Ammon praises me, he said, that my majesty will proceed along the mountain pass. Let him who will among you go upon these roads ye have mentioned, and let him who will among you come in, in thy, the following of my majesty. Shall they think among these enemies, those enemies who Ra detests, does his majesty proceed upon another road? He begins to be frightened of us, so they will think. There was no further discussion. With Thutmose in the lead, the army started single file up the mountain pass. And Pharaoh and his vanguard reached the mountaintop and encamped there for the night, while the main body of his army was still far below. From the heights the next day, Thutmose could look down on the city of Megiddo. The enemy's scouts had warned of Pharaoh's approach, and the Syrians were ready and waiting. In the green plain below, their charioteers and foot soldiers were drawn up in battle formation. The sun glanced off their war helmets, their emblazoned shields, and the sleek hides of their powerful war horses. Behind the Syrian army, the gates of Megiddo were closed, and on the ramparts atop the city's walls, the townspeople stood masked and silent, looking anxiously toward the mountain. Pharaoh did not hesitate at the sight of the formidable army below. Without pausing for the rest of his troops to catch up with him, he started down the mountainside, his vanguard trailing after him in a long, untidy line. And now occurred the first absurdity of a most absurd battle. The Syrians watched Pharaoh come down onto the plain. They watched him choose a site and make camp. They watched the men of his vanguard straggle in behind him, and they did not attack. If they had, Thutmose would surely have been captured or killed. Thut and Egyptian history might have taken a very different turn, but no Syrian command was given. No Syrian charge was made. The enemy watched without moving as Thutmose settled in for the night. And when darkness fell, the enemy retired to their tents, allowing most of Pharaoh's army to come down the mountain during the night and join him in camp. By dawn, the Egyptian army in the plain was almost at full strength. The Battle of Megiddo, the first battle in history of which there is a detailed record, began at daylight the next morning. The Egyptians and Syrians faced each other across the open plain. And as the, on the day before, the anxious townspeople of Megiddo stood massed atop the city's walls. As the sun rose, a single trumpet shrilled in the Egyptian camp. Pharaoh, resplendent in full battle dress, thrust aside the flap of the royal pavilion and strode to his waiting war chariot. Grasping the reins in one hand, he turned to face his waiting charioteers and his eager ranks of foot soldiers. Then he flung up one arm. A great shout filled the quiet morning. The charioteers' nervous horses reared and lunged forward into a gallop with Thutmose like a flame of fire in the lead. The massed chariots swept forward across the plain. Behind them, their shouts drowned out by the thundering hooves raced the foot soldiers, swords drawn and at the ready. And now occurred the second absurdity of the Battle of Megiddo. The Syrians stood as if paralyzed while the Egyptians swept toward them. Then suddenly, without lifting a lance or fitting arrow to bow, they broke ranks and fled. In panic and pandemonium, they turned and made for the gates of Megiddo. The astonished Egyptians reined in their snorting horses. The foot soldiers stumbled to a halt and the entire army was treated to a sight it would never forget. The prudent townspeople of Megiddo had locked the city gates before the battle began. Unable to get inside, the frantic Syrians raced about beneath the walls, shouting for help to the watchers above. The Megiddians, equally panic-stricken, began tearing off their clothing, including their underwear, Tying these garments into ropes, they lowered them over the walls and hauled the Syrians, dancing like puppets on strings up to safety on the ramparts. Wow. Egy uh, this is 18th Dynasty relief sculpture showing Egyptian chariots and horses. So it must have been quite the sight to see these big horses and chariots and Egyptians in full gear. Gear. <laughs> <laughs> 
a rich and royal army coming at them. If the Egyptians had been less amused or less greedy, they could have taken Megiddo then and there. But the fleeing Syrians had dropped most of their weapons and had left their war chariots and richly furnished tents unprotected on the field. At the sight of this booty, the Egyptian troops ran riot. Neither Pharaoh nor his commanders could control them. They plundered far into the night, thrusting inlaid Syrian daggers through their belts, ripping down the rich hangings in the enemy's tents, and making off with the abandoned gold and silver plate and the clothing, ornaments, and jewels. When there was nothing left to plunder, the exhausted and treasure-laden troops were brought before Pharaoh. He sat upon a throne in front of the royal pavilion, his face stern in the flickering torchlight. If his army had taken Megiddo when the enemy broke ranks and fled, he said all Syria would now be in Egyptians' hands. Had ye captured the city afterward, behold, I would have given many sacrifices to Ra this day, because every chief of every country that has revolted is within it, and because it is the capture of a thousand cities, this capture of Megiddo. It was true enough, the princes of Syria, with their families and retainers, were now safely barricaded behind the walls of Megiddo. The only recourse was to lay siege to the city and starve the enemy into submission. This the Egyptians did, and after several weeks, their food and water gone, the Syrians surrendered. As Thutmose later described it, Then that fallen one, the prince of Kadesh, together with the chiefs who were with him, caused all their children to come forth to my majesty with many products of gold and silver, all their horses with their trappings, their great chariots of gold and silver with their painted equipment, all their battle armor, their bows, their arrows, and all their implements of war, those things indeed with which they had come to fight against my majesty. And now they brought them as tribute to my majesty while they stood on their walls, giving praise to my majesty. Then my majesty caused them to swear an oath, saying, Quote, Never again will we do evil against Thutmose the Third. May he live forever, our Lord, in our lifetime, for we have witnessed his power. End quote. Then my majesty allowed them the allowed to them the road to their cities, and they went, all of them, on donkeys, for I had taken their horses, and I carried off their citizens to Egypt and their property likewise. And thus having spared the lives of his enemies and sent and sent them home in humiliation on the backs of donkeys, that most broke camp and headed back for Egypt. The victorious army reached Thebes early in October. News of Pharaoh's return had swept up river before him, and the entire capital was waiting to greet him. As Thutmose paraded his troops and his booty through the crowded streets, the Thebans stared dumbfounded, for Pharaoh had come home with 2,000 Syrian horses, 924 enemy war chariots, 1,921 Asiatic bulls, 2,000 small cattle, 20,500 additional animals, and almost 2,000 prisoners of war. It was these last that caused most comment. The Thebans pursed their lips as 87 wide-eyed sons and daughters of the Syrian princes passed by. Thutmose had brought them down into Egypt as hostages for their father's good behavior. The little princes and princesses were followed by 1,796 non-royal male and female prisoners destined to work as slaves in the temples and at court. As the Syrians shuffled by, manacled together, the Thebans did not trouble to hide their, mis- their distaste. Their prisoners had swarthy complexions, bearded faces, and wore multicolored woolen clothing. They seemed abominable to the clean-shaven Egyptians, who wore nothing but spotless white linen. Days of feasting followed Pharaoh's triumphant return, climaxed by a great ceremony at Karnak. There, in gratitude to Ammon for leading him to victory, Thutmose presented most of the Syrian booty to the king of the gods and his priesthood. He gave Ammon three Syrian towns with sole right to the tribute therefrom, and tribute that all conquered towns from now on had to pay Pharaoh each year. And he gave the temple extensive lands in lower and upper Egypt, which he stocked with the captured herds of Syrian cattle. 
These rich gifts were the beginning of Ammon's vast fortune. It was to grow over the years until the wealth and power of the king of the gods rivaled that of the pharaoh himself. Thutmose III's first campaign set a pattern that he was to follow for the next 20 years. Each spring after the Egyptian harvests were in, he set forth at the head of his army. During his early years as pharaoh, Thutmose had, quote, to smite, end quote, the rebellious Syrians time and time again. But their small independent city-states were no match for the unified might of Egypt. Over the years, Thutmose, Thutmose conquered all of Palestine, all of Syria, and the trading cities along the Phoenician coast. He warred north of Syria in the land of a powerful people called the Mitanni, and he campaigned south of Egypt, bringing all of Nubia under Egyptian control. And when he was done, Thutmose was pharaoh of an empire that stretched from the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates River all the way south to the fourth cataract of the Nile. His name was feared and his word was law throughout the eastern Mediterranean world and beyond. The rulers of distant Crete and Babylonia hastened to send rich gifts to the invincible warrior king who now sat upon the throne of the pharaohs. Thutmose ruled his vast empire with a light hand. He established Egyptian garrisons and administrative districts throughout the conquered lands, but his vassal states were allowed to govern themselves much as they, much as they pleased, as long as they sent their annual tribute of gold, produce, and livestock to pharaoh's warehouses each year. Thutmose continued to bring the younger sons and daughters of the Syrian princes down into Egypt with him after each campaign. They were educated at court with his own children and the sons and daughters of the nobility. Many of the little Syrian princes, princesses stayed on in Egypt to become the brides of court nobles. And the young Syrian princes became so Egyptianized, as Thutmose had hoped, that when they returned to their native cities, they ruled they're more as Pharaoh's ambassadors than as his vassals. This is the, this is the chapel of Thutmose III. Toward the end of his military career, Thutmose's power and reputation were so great that his annual campaigns were little more than military parades. Preceded by his heralds, Pharaoh marched his veteran troops along the dusty roads and byways of the Middle East. The richness of his rit retinue dazzled all beholders, and the mere sight of his enormous army was enough to deter the vassal states from raising voice or finger against Egypt's might. Days of feasting and thanksgiving to Ammon followed Pharaoh's return to the valley each fall. Thutmose continued to shower the king of the gods with wealth. He enlarged Karnak and built a botanical garden and zoo with its precincts. These he filled with rare foreign plants, trees, flowers, and wild animals that he collected on his campaigns abroad. In his few moments of leisure, he designed exquisite bowls and vessels for temple use. During the mild Egyptian winter, Thutmose devoted himself to his many projects at home. Accompanied by his royal architects and engineers and by his pet baboon, he voyaged from one end of the valley to the other, on an annual tour of inspection. He conferred with each of his local governors to make sure all went well in their provinces. He presided at the opening of the new canals and irrigation projects he had instig instig instigated. And he visited the more than 30 sites along the river where his architects were restoring old temples or building new ones. He was as tireless, energetic, and able a ruler as he was a general. Quote, Lo, his majesty was one who knew what happened, said his proud vizier, uh, Reckmeyer. There was nothing of which he was ignorant. He was Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom, in everything. There was no matter which he did not carry out, end quote. At court, Thutmose received a constant stream of ambassadors and couriers from all corners of his far-flung empire. Some came on state business, others came bringing the rich tribute that now poured into Egypt from the Eastern Mediterranean world and Africa. Week in and week out, foreign ships put in at the Theban port with cargoes destined for Pharaoh's treasury. One day it would be the Nubians, tall and black. Their bearers padded through the city streets toward the royal precinct, carrying ebony, 
ostrich feathers and ivory upon their backs. Behind them came their herders, calling out to one another in their strange tongue as they drove their skittish cattle through the narrow alleys to Pharaoh's stockyards. Another day, it would be the Asiatics, bringing thoroughbred horses for the royal stables, war chariots, pottery, and great bales of grain and fruit. As the years went by, the once wide-eyed Thebans grew so accustomed to the exotic sights in their streets that they scarcely looked up from their workbenches as the riches of the Eastern world passed by outside. Thutmose III's wife, Hatshepsut's tiny elder daughter, had died when very young. Pharaoh had then married her sister, who had given him a fine and vigorous son. As Thutmose nearly 60, neared 60, he made this 20-year-old boy co-ruler with him of Egypt and her empire. A year later, Thutmose was dead. Quote, Lo, the king completed his lifetime of many years, splendid in might, in valor and triumph. End quote, said one of his grieving generals. Quote, he mounted to heaven. He joined the sun, the divine limbs mingling with him who begat him. End quote. Like his grandfather before him, Thutmose III was buried in an underground tomb in the desolate Valley of the Kings. With him was buried the embalmed body of his pet baboon. Thutmose was history's first great general. He left his mark upon the ancient world, and he changed the course of Egyptian history, for better or worse. From the day that he marched forth, quote, to smite, end quote, the Asiatics, Egypt's peaceful days of relative isolation within the boundaries of the valley were over. Thutmose left his country, monarch of nearly all she surveyed, and, like it or not, the, quote, vile, end quote, end quote, wretched, end quote, foreigner, was now a part of Egyptian life. Cretans, Nubians, Syrians, Mitannians, Babylonians, and Palestinians were now a familiar sight on the streets of Thebes. They came and went as merchants, traders, slaves, sightseers, or bearers of tribute. The tradition-bound Egyptians grew used to these strangers, but they never quite trusted or accepted them. The valley people continued to deride the foreigners' odd ways of life, their strange gods, and most of all, their inquiring and speculative habits of mind. On a dark night in AD 1871, some 3,300 years after Thutmose III had died, these tomb robber, three tomb robbers crept out of the Valley of, kings, of the Kings. Walking single file, they started for home along a path that crossed the face of the cliff above Hatshepsut's Temple of Deir al-Bari. All three men were weary and out of sorts. They had been digging in the Valley of the Kings for months without making a single find. Suddenly, the leader of the band, an Arab named Abderasul, stopped short in his tracks. A small black hole in the cliff face had caught his eye. Curious, he picked up a peggle, pebble and chucked it into the opening. Then he and his companions stiffened, for they heard the pebble strike bottom with a faint, hollow sound, somewhere far down behind the face of the cliff. This sound meant only one thing to thieves as experienced as they. There was an ancient shaft behind the cliff face. Cliff face. Forgetting their weariness, the three tomb robbers went at the little hole with their pickaxes. In a matter of moments, it was large enough for Abderasol to get his head and shoulders inside. Working swiftly with great excitement, he tied one end of a coil rope around his body and checked his matches and candles. Then he eased himself cautiously into the hole, feet first, and ordered his companions to lower him into the darkness. The long coil of rope was almost played out when a sharp tug signaled that Abderasul had reached the bottom. Up on the cliff path, Abderasul's brother and the third thief waited tensely. Not a sound reached them from below. Seconds stretched into minutes, minutes into a quarter, an hour. Back in the desert, a hyena wailed and chuckled. Bats swooped and circled through the night air. An owl hooted softly from Hatshepsut's ruined temple down below. Here's the eerie Valley of the Kings. <laughs> 
tourist roads now lead to the once hidden underground tombs of the pharaohs. The two men eyed each other uneasily. Both knew that Marissa, Marisker, snake goddess of the ancient Egyptians, lay coiled and ready to sink her deadly fangs into anyone who disturbed a pharaoh's rest. And both had heard of the curse that laid down by the ancient priests as they sealed the tombs of their god kings. Quote, I have set ablaze all the area around me. The flames will seize any man who approaches me with hostile intent. End quote. What had happened to Abdul Rasul? At this very moment, a blood-curdling scream came from the bottom of the shaft, and the rope began to dance violently. The two thieves on the cliff path looked at each other wildly and began hauling the rope upward with all their might. Abd Abdul Rasul's disheveled hair at last appeared in the hope opening, then his wide, terror-filled face, terror-filled eyes, and finally his smudged and sweat-streaked face. Hurry, he gasped as he tumbled out onto the path. An afrit, an evil demon. There's an afrit down below. This was all that his superstitious companions needed to hear. Eyes starting from their sockets. They ran down the path as fast as they could go with Abderasul hard on their heels. Back in the sleeping village, the three bid each other a shaky good night. Then Abderasul and his brother hurried off to bed or so the third thief supposed. Next morning, the story of the Afrit at the bottom of the shaft was all over the village. A few days later, those who dared crept along the cliff path to the black hole. They soon came pelting back with news that a foul and evil smell, the sure sign of an Afrit was coming from the opening. From that day on, the villagers stayed well away from the cliff face and the hole where the evil demon dwelled. And so time passed. Nearly 10 years had gone by when the directors of the great museum downriver in Cairo began receiving puzzling reports. Priceless Egyptian antiqu antiquities, never seen by the museum staff, were turning up in private collections in Europe and America. Since by law, the museum had to pass on all ancient objects before they could be sold or exported, this could only mean that native thieves were at work. They must have found a hidden cache of valuable relics, which they were selling off illegally, one by one. The museum ordered a secret investigation. All evidence pointed to, the th to Thebes, and finally to Abdur Rasul, who was arrested. Emil Bruksh, the museum's assistant curator, boarded the, the river steamer, for Egypt's ancient capital, and there he listened in astonishment to the story Abdul Rasul had to tell. Then his companions, when his companions had lowered him into the bottom of the cliff shaft ten years before, the tomb robber said he had him had found himself in a narrow corridor. It was piled high with wooden coffins. Crawling over these, Abdul Rasul had followed the corridor to an underground burial chamber. There he had found even more coffins. Abdur Rasul could not say how many, for his eyes were riveted on the chamber floor. It was ankle deep in gold and silver and alabaster funerary equipment of all kinds. Abdur Rasul had stared, stupefied at the riches before him. His first impulse had been to race back to the shaft and call his companions, but then he hesitated. The friend who waited above with Abdur Rasul's brother was a good thief and a good companion, but he was not a blood relative. With fierce Arab loyalty, Abdur Rasul decided that his clan alone should benefit from this incredible find. And so he had seated himself on one of the ancient coffins and tried to think of a way to keep these underground riches in the family. The Afrit was his answer. Later that night, he had let his brother in on the secret. When they were sure that their friend, the third thief, was safely abed, the two men had crept out of their house. They had found and killed a donkey, dragged it back up the cliff path, and heaved it down the shaft. In a few days, the donkey's decomposing body had given off an evil afrit smell. The villagers dared not explore the shaft. And for the next 10 years, Abdul Rasul and his brother had safely plundered the underground chamber by night, quietly selling its treasures to tourists and black market dealers. This is a golden headdress, the kind of priceless treasure Abdul Rasul found at the bottom of the secret shaft behind the cliffs. Emil Bruksh of the Cairo Museum 
Listen to, to this story with growing incredulity and excitement. Though it was July and nearly 120 degrees in the shade, he went immediately to the shaft and had himself lowered. Like Abdurasul before him, Bruksh was stunned by what he saw. He crawled along the corridor into the underground chamber where, in his own words, quote, every inch was covered with coffins and antiquities of all kinds. My astonishment was so overpowering that I scarcely knew whether I was awake or whether it was only a dream. The further I advanced, the greater was the wealth displayed, end quote. But it was the coffins more than the antiquities that excited Brooksh. Archaeologists had excavated tomb after tomb in the Valley of the Kings, only to find that they had been robbed of their royal mummies and funerary equipment long ago. But here, before Bruksh's unbelieving eyes, were the mummies of 36 of the most famous kings and queens of ancient Egypt. Among them were Ramses the Great, Pharaoh Ahmos, deliverer of Egypt from the Hyksos, Queen Amis, mother of Hatshepsut, Thutmose I, Thutmose II, and his mummy broken into three pieces, Pharaoh Thutmose III. Ancient priests had removed these famous kings and queens from their tombs in the Valley of the Kings during a period of lawless, late, lawlessness late in Egypt's history. A series of bad floods had caused widespread famine and poverty, and thieves in numbers began despoiling the royal tombs. The ancient priests hastily ordered the shaft sunk behind the cliff above Deir el-Bari. When it was completed, they secretly reburied the kings and queens in simple wooden coffins with as much of their funerary equipment as they were able to carry. Until Abdul Rasul and his companions had stumbled upon the entrance to the shaft, the royal mummies had lain undisturbed in their hiding place for some 3,000 years. Bruksh ordered the underground chamber cleared. The royal mummies and their belongings were taken downriver to the Cairo Museum. Their staff experts carefully put together the broken pieces of Thutmose III's body. And then, fascinated, they called their colleagues in to see. The first great general in the history of the world had been barely five feet tall. <laughs> and that's the end of the chapter.